Possibly the most famous track from The Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess, is Midna's Lament. Now we've talked about the music from the Zelda franchise multiple times on this channel because the entirety of its music from its nearly 40 year history is absolutely incredible. And if you're a fan of the Zelda games and you happen to be an aspiring piano player, you've probably always thought that the music from the games would be amazing to be able to play on the piano. Well, Midna's Lament, I think, is the perfect song to do exactly that. And not only because of the fact that the entire song is basically just piano to begin with, but because it's the perfect blend of something that sounds complex and beautiful while not actually being that hard to play. So let's check it out and find out what makes Midna's Lament maybe the perfect Zelda song to learn on the piano. Yeah, there's so many little intricacies about this that just make it sound so fluid and beautiful, almost like there's more to it than there actually is. Now, when we first start the tune, we introduce this figure that's going to be kind of used throughout the entire thing. Now, it's gonna move through a variety of different chord changes, but it basically looks like this. Now here's what's interesting about this figure. It's a little bit tricky. And that's why I think this entire piece almost functions like a left hand etude of some kind. It's really great practice at that left hand dexterity. And that's because the melodies in the right hand are not particularly complex, nor are they difficult to reach. But this left hand poses some difficulties. Now check this out. We have a set of six notes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now we only have five fingers, right? And the shape of this chord inherently makes it a little bit difficult to reach because sometimes, yeah, we could start halfway through the hand and then kind of cross over. That might be a way to do it. That would actually work just fine, right? The way that I've kind of been playing this is uh, using my whole hand and then just kind of crossing over with one finger to play that top note. Now, when we're not playing a melody note, you could use two hands to play this figure or just for the one note, but the reality is the majority of the time we are going to be playing something in the right hand. So it might be better to get into the habit of playing the entire figure with the left hand somehow. I've been finding that perfectly easy enough. The only tricky part about it is once you play that top note, well, your fifth finger has to get back down to play the root again. So that could be kind of difficult. Let's try another way. Let's go three, two, one, crossover. Maybe just three, two, one, three, two, one. Three, two, one, three, two, one. Three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. Yeah, that works too. How else could I do it here? Four, three, two, one, three, one. That's a little weird, but it works. You can do that too. Now, what I wonder is when we get to the next part of this song, is doing it any particular way going to be more difficult to continue as the chords change? Let's talk about what those are to begin with. So this is an outline of like a D minor nine chord. It's really, really pretty. And it's just a D minor chord with the seventh with the ninth. Now, when we call something D minor nine, we're kind of implying that the seventh is included. Generally speaking, when we talk about upper extensions of chords, meaning anything beyond that first octave where all of our primary chord tones exist, one, three, five, and seven, anything above that, if we say like 11, well, it usually implies that everything below it is also included. So if I say D minor 11, well, we're generally going to expect that there is a nine, and that there is a seven as well, right? Same if we said D minor 13, like that. We would expect that the 11 is there, the nine is there, the seven is there, and all the way back down. So that's just sort of something that we do with chord symbols. Like when you see a big number, 13, 11, something like that, you can usually safely assume that everything below it is sort of implied. And if those things below it need to be altered in some way, then the chord will specify that. So for example, let's say it's a D13 with a sharp 11 and a flat nine. Well, that would sound like this. But if we just said D13, we're gonna assume that everything else is just where it naturally would be, like that. So we start out with this D minor nine sound, and it's arpeggiated. And then we bring in our melody. B 
Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And I love the sort of harmonic ambiguity here. We're clearly in this, this space and we can fill that in. We heard this note as well, so we can fill that note in. Oh, and we heard that note too. So there we go. We filled in our scale. These are all the notes that we're using, which is a D Dorian scale. So this whole thing, our home base that we're establishing is D Dorian. And we kind of just sit here. We have one slight change. This is our sort of second chord that we use, which is only just one note removed. We have this beautiful, And the really cool thing about the recording here is that there's a delay used on the piano, which makes it sound like this. We get that slight echoey delay sound and it kind of gives it almost like a rhythm. It's really, really beautiful. Slight alteration in the melody the second time. Oh, that delay, that delay is so gorgeous. This whole thing, again, we're just playing around in this D Dorian space. All those notes fit. We basically haven't changed anything fundamental about the harmony yet. We have two extra bars here before introducing... Oof. And then we kind of go back to our D Dorian space. What happens right there? We introduce E flat major, A flat major, and then right to an A dominant chord, which of course functions as our one, two, three, four, five chord going back to that D minor, that D Dorian space, right? It's absolutely beautiful. And this is such an interesting, Going up a half step is just a really great way to open things up. It kind of is a bright change. We've established this kind of dark, D minor is not really like a, it would, it would feel a lot darker if it was like a D, like a D minor six chord, or even like a D minor major seven chord. Those chords sound like they're home base in D minor. They're very dark, right? But once we make that Dorian with the minor seventh, it's a little bit less concrete in its darkness. It's dark for sure, but it has a little hint of like, hmm, we could sort of go anywhere from here. And when we release up into that E flat major sound, and then continue to work that around to A flat major, we get this hint of this beauty opening up, right? And then all of a sudden we throw it up a half step to the five chord and then back to our D minor. It's a beautiful sequence, very, very simple. And when we look at how that's laid out on the piano, we're continuing our left hand upward arpeggio. So now we're introducing this new shape, E flat major. We, we get the same exact thing as we had in D minor, the same notes, but now it's an E flat major. So each one of those notes is one, two, three, five, seven, nine, except in this case, E flat is major. So we have a major third instead of in D minor, we had a minor third, right? But it's basically the same shape. Now, when we go down to our A flat major, this is where we deviate slightly. We outline the chord one, three, five, seven, and then we just like continue it on up as if we were starting another octave of that chord. And you can see what I'm doing here. I'm kind of playing it how it fits the hand, A flat major, and then I'm just simply crossing over to play three and one before jumping back down. That's it. This is a pretty easy shape to play, right? And then the E flat, of course, um, I kind of do the same thing as I do on the D minor there. Just reaching over with the second finger to play that one note that's out of reach for the hand. This one's a little odd, right? A dominant. 
because if we do what we did on A flat, that means we're gonna end up on this C sharp with our first finger, which we generally, usually try to avoid playing black keys with our thumb, because it sometimes can just be a little awkward to get up there because we're like reaching in, right? Because the thumb is a short finger and we want to reach in to play those black keys with our hand. That's why our hand is actually really well set up for the piano. We use the longer fingers to reach in and play those black keys and the shorter fingers tend to stay on the white keys a little more. So if we use this fingering here, it's not that we can't do it. It's just that it's a little odd. This is one of those instances where I might actually just deal with that. It's not that hard, and it gives me a lot of hand space to get from this C-sharp back down to the A. Yeah, you know, I might actually deal with it in this context. And now we're starting to introduce a new rhythmic figure in the melody. We have this dotted quarter figure, which creates like a two over three, right? For every three quarter notes in the left hand, we have two dotted eighths in the right hand. So we get this da, ba, do, one, two, and three, one, two, and three. That's kind of an interesting choice. Uh, melodically speaking, because here we are on uh, A flat major, and F, G, that works perfectly fine there. This note kind of comes out of nowhere, right? But leads us right back into our original melody again. So you can see how this is kind of becoming like a left hand exercise. We have all these different shapes. That one, that one, that one, that one. All just in this first part of the melody. Now, after we finish this a second time, we have this beautiful string section that comes in, but this is very, very easy to simply just replicate on the piano instead. So right there, that string part can easily be replicated on the piano. We can just play that melody ourselves, right? And in the left hand, we have something really interesting going on where we're starting a new figure that we haven't played yet. So this figure is interesting because all we're gonna do is move it down one note at a time, but it's gonna be the exact same thing each time. So first, we start out with a fifth each time, right? but we're gonna follow that fifth simply with the next white key up. Now, sometimes that's a half step. In this case, it's a half step, but on the next one, that's a whole step, right? So it's not accurate to say, well, we're gonna follow it with a half step because it's only a half step right here, then it's a whole step, then it's a whole step. But the last one is a half step again. So it's just, we'll, we'll call it the next white key up. And then all we do after that is jump up a third and play a triad. Now we move it down. One more. One more. And it's that simple. So again, we can see how this is really a great exercise in our left hand dexterity. Because all we have to do on top of it is let this melody ring. And it's not particularly busy. There's not a whole lot going on. That's it. This is where we reach the most difficult part of this whole thing, because we have a number of different chords coming up in fairly quick succession, but they're very cool and they do some really neat things harmonically. The first line we have goes like this. Well, we've just played that on our way down, so we're almost coming back up now. But now we introduce that shape, which can be a little tricky to execute like that, and now we're gonna continue on up. This is just G major triads an octave apart, and now we have one more. 
for releasing to this shape, which we know very well, we just, we know it from D instead of A, but it's exactly the same thing. This is just the intro where we go back down and then instead of finishing up on an A, we now move back to our D minor place. And this brings us back to the top of the whole thing. It loops perfectly back to the beginning and it can be repeated as many times as necessary as you play through this part of the game. Now, that walk up is really cool because harmonically all it's doing is it's starting out on this sort of F major-ish sound and it's just climbing up chromatically. Here we go. Now, now you could look at this, you could say that this is a D7 just with a couple pieces of that D7 in the bottom, right? You might even call this, could you call this like an F sharp diminished? Sure, kind of the exact same thing though, right? So does it really matter? I don't know. And then we end up on this G major chord before letting it go. Now this right here is the exact same shape that we just used down here. It's the same thing, we just moved it up, that's all. So again, if we're calling this like a D7, we can call this an E7, right? It's just on top of its third down here before going to A minor. Before going to D minor. This is such a great piece to work on for your piano technique because it's not particularly difficult, but there are some things about it that may be difficult as you're learning them, but those things, as you work them out, they will really help to develop that left-hand dexterity, which as we know, for us uh, right-handed people, generally speaking, this is the hardest part about learning the piano, is getting the left hand to do what we want it to actually do. So as you can see, the construction of this piece, I think just makes it absolutely perfect to learn on the piano even if you don't have a ton of experience. If you're looking for a way to get into playing some video game music, this has got to be near the top of your list to learn. And let me know in the comments below how you're getting along with it because this is one of the most beautiful pieces of all the Zelda games and it happens to be absolutely perfect for learning on the piano. Let me know if there's any other piano centric stuff from the Zelda soundtracks that you would love to learn because these are super fun to break down. Anyways, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you in the next one.